Well, uh, a very warm welcome to you all this morning uh, on this Reformation Sunday. Did you know it was Reformation Sunday today? Do you know what day it is on Tuesday? Yeah? It's Reformation Day. I heard someone say it over there. Yes. Uh, October the 31st is what we call Reformation Day because that's the day a guy from Germany um, nailed some, uh, uh, a letter on the door of the church and uh, it was a time, it was about 500 years ago, it was a time when the church uh, started teaching things that weren't in the Bible. And this guy called Martin Luther said, no, this is wrong. And so the truths of the, the Reformation were recovered, uh, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on what the scriptures say alone, to the glory of God alone. Uh, they're called the, the five solas from the Latin. Don't worry about that. Anyway, so the, um, we're going to sing. Uh, well, before we sing, I'm going to read a verse from Ephesians 2, which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, on the basis of the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. And we're going to start by singing a hymn that Martin Luther wrote, uh, a hymn uh, based on Psalm 46. A mighty fortress is our God. So let's stand and sing hymn number 388.
Let's pray to God now. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can come to you as our mighty fortress. We thank you that we can gather this morning uh, and join with all uh, of your people around the world who are celebrating today that you have saved us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on the scriptures alone, and for your glory alone. We thank you that these truths mean that we can have hope, uh, not just for this life, but beyond the grave, that we will be part of an abiding kingdom that will not fail. We pray uh, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are around the world facing persecution for what they believe. We pray too for those who are in areas that are torn apart by, by war. We think of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and Russia. We pray too for your comfort for those in Israel and Palestine. We thank you that as we've just sung in this hymn, we can be confident that you will keep us safe. That even if people might take away our possessions, our loved ones, even our very lives, they cannot take away the hope that we have because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. They cannot take away that abiding kingdom that lasts forever into eternity. They cannot take away our citizenship in that kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, that will last far longer than any nation, any empire, any state on this world. And we thank you that because of what Jesus has done, because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on the scriptures alone, to your glory alone, we thank you that that means that we don't come to you based on any merit of our own, not on our works that we should boast, but only because of your grace. So standing on your grace uh, and not on our own merits, we come to you in prayer and we pray as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's great to uh, have Owen uh, Batston, is that how you pronounce it? Batstone, thank you. Batstone, uh, pastor of Park End Church in Cardiff. Uh, it's great to have you with us. We look forward to your ministry uh, to us. After this service, there'll be uh, uh, refreshments downstairs, so please do stay if you can for a cup of tea or coffee uh, and something to nibble. And then this evening, we'll be back here for si at six o'clock uh, where we'll be joined by Tower Valley Church. And there'll be refreshments after this evening's service as well. On Wednesday, the uh, Bible study and prayer meeting at 7 o'clock will be led by David Tucker of Ebenezer Baptist Church, Swansea. Uh, and there won't be any children's meetings this week because it's half-term week. So uh, uh, don't come along here expecting the children's meetings because the, the building will be empty and locked. Um, next Sunday, uh, 10.30 in the morning, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper, communion together. 
and uh, and then we'll have a, a service as normal at 6 p.m. as well. And Anaidin Britton from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Cardiff will be uh, preaching for us next Sunday. The Blythewood shoe boxes. Uh, if you've done a Blythewood shoe box, you need to give that to Rachel this morning. Um, uh, but uh, if you want to do a Samaritan's Purse shoe box, you can do do that until the 12th of November. And uh, there are these leaflets about what to put in the Bly- um, Samaritan's Purse shoe box. Uh, and if you want to know more information about that, do talk to Anna. Oh, and the uh, Christian Institute... Um, that's a, a Christian group that uh, lobby for um, matters to do with Christian ethics and morals in the public arena, in politics and legal uh, things. And uh, they're having a meeting in, in Cardiff in, uh, on Thursday at 7.30 in the evening. Um, that will be held at Highfields Church. They'll be giving important updates on key contemporary issues and there's leaflets about that downstairs if you're interested in going uh, talk to Anona um, after the service right that's enough from me I'm going to hand over to Owen now over to you oh well good morning from me and thanks for having me Um, a Cardiffian in your midst I'm very honoured that you ventured so low to have me Come, it's a real honour. Um, I've got lots of bits of paper here I've got to follow, but I think I'm going to talk to the children now, is it? Right, good, because i got a quiz. So let's see if you're as clever as Cardiff children. There's, there's a few chapters in the Bible where certain animals are called wise. God thinks they're wise because they do certain things, and he wants us to do them because he wants us to be wise. So I'm going to play Who Am I? All right, and and, uh, I'm not, right, so, and then, yeah, we'll do who am I, I'll give you some clues. So, here's clue number one. I'm not a human. All right, I'll give you another one. I can carry objects up to 50 times my own weight. Hmm. Objects up to 50, how much stone do you weigh? How much do you weigh, do you know? No idea. Yeah? Right. We got a problem now. <laughs> We've got a problem. You've got it right, but we'll pretend you haven't because I gotta stretch this out a bit longer. <laughs> so come back to you in a bit. I'll give you some more clues. I use my head to block holes in the side of my house sometimes. To stop intruders getting in. (laughs) It's lost its wind now. We all know the answer, isn't it? Well, I keep going because I'll just give you some interesting facts then. Um, If you gathered all of my friends and family together, all of my friends and family together across planet Earth, we would weigh the same amount as if you gathered all the humans together across the world. So there's a lot of us. I'll give you another one. Um, Sometimes I bully and enslave others to do my work for me. I'll give you another one. My great-grandparents were around with the dinosaurs. And then, here's here's a big one. Some of my houses, or my friends' houses, can stretch for thousands of miles. It's a big house, isn't it? Thousands of miles. Who am I? She doesn't even need to repeat herself. She's like, I got this after clue two, mum. I don't need to say it again. The answer is an ant. Did you know that? And here's what the Bible says about an ant. It says, ants are creatures of little strength, but they're wise because they store up their food in the summer. And God thinks that's wise, if you store up your food in the summer. Why do you think it's wise for an ant to gather lots of food for himself and his friends in the summer? Go. Yeah. 
You go, yep. Wow. You are cleverer than Cardiff people. <laughs> the education system in Swansea. Were you homeschooled? Yeah. Ah, that's the keys. That's it, see? Because there's no food in the winter for an ant. All the ant Tesco's are shut in the winter. So they got to go shopping in the summer and f fill up their cupboards enough because it's all, nothing's there for them in the winter. Nothing's growing for them. In other words, God says it's wise to do what? Plan ahead. Be wise, God says it's wise. And I think the whole point of the chapter and the whole Bible is about us being wise for a day coming in the future that we've got to get ready for now. So when you see an ant doing his shopping in the Tesco's in the summer, you've got to remember he's planning for the future. And then you've got to ask yourself, am I planning for the future? Because God thinks that's wise. And he says there's a day coming where this world's going to end and we've got to get ready for the world to come. So we've got to be wise for that day because we want to go to heaven. He says you've got to plan for that today. That's the message, really. And here's how you plan to get to heaven one day. Here's how you plan for it today. You want to know? Well, it's the heart of the Reformation message, actually. It just so happens that you place all your hope and all your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, if you're not his friend, you tell him, now, I don't know you. Please save me. Come into my life and get me ready for that day. Forgive me my sins and make me ready for heaven now. You can all do that now. And he will save you. And then you're ready for that great day when you'll enter the next world to come, which is even better than this one. So there we are. When you see an ant, ask yourself, am I ready for the future? Excellent answers all round. Well done. Right, I think now, I don't think we got a song about an ant, but we have got a children's song about the whole point of the story about the ant. Why don't you put your trust in Jesus? So do we stand to sing? Yeah, yeah, we'll stand. Let's stand. Excellent, thank you. Right, I don't know if you come to church regularly. Lots of people in Cardiff don't anymore. So I'm going to explain what we're going to do next. And uh, we're going to pray to the living God. And he hears us when we pray. If we pray in the name of his wonderful son, Jesus. So let's pray to God our Father in heaven. Our Father, we thank you for this day, a lovely day day with the sun shining. Thank you, Lord, that we've woken up in houses and we've got clothes and food in our fridges. We thank you for this church that we can come and see each other as friends and it's warm inside and we've got so many privileges that other people haven't got across the world. <clears throat> thank you for schools and homeschool and education and safekeeping and friends and family and food and Warmth, you're so good to us, Lord. Thank you, our Father, for looking after us all the days of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns this morning over everyone and everything. And thank you we can trust him with our lives. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone in the room or listening at home who don't, doesn't quite trust the Lord Jesus with, with their lives, that they would do it this morning. And it would be a life-changing service of true worship, perhaps for people for the first time ever. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, his saving power and his friendship and his honesty and his glory. Thank you that 
We've seen something of it here as a church. Please be with this church, Lord, and grow it. And may the gospel message spill into Cliddoch and beyond. We pray for all of your churches gathering across the UK this morning, preaching the Reformation message of the Lord Jesus Christ who saves sinners. And there's nothing we can do to contribute to that. He does it all for us. Help us to trust in him. We confess our sins, Lord, as people this morning. We're sorry for even the many sins we've committed this day. Please forgive us. Please be with those, Lord, who can't be here today, who, but what they would love to be. Maybe they're ill or they've gone on holiday. We pray that you would bless them richly with whatever they're going through in life, that you would be very near to them in your wonderful fatherly way. I hear, Lord, that there's a new minister coming here. We pray for him. Pray that you would bless him with your Holy Spirit and power and that you would save lots of people through this church's witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you again for all of your mercies upon us. And we give you thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right then, if you've got a Bible... Um, please go to uh, Luke chapter 18. I don't know whose Bible this is, but I'm going to use it if that's all right. Luke chapter 18. That's in the New Testament. Have you got page numbers or have we all got different Bibles here? Have you got pew Bibles? Well, what's the number? Uh, Luke chapter 18. Oh, it's this one. Uh, 1042, because we'll do Luke chapter 18, and I'll just read verses 9 down to 14. And some of you will have heard this before, and it's a famous story. Luke chapter 18, 9 to 14. He also, that's he's talking about Jesus, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so reads the word of God. Thanks be to God. God willing, we'll look at that in a bit. But before we do, I think we're going to sing again. And it's supplement number 77, but should be on the screen. And it's a Reformation song. So, when you're ready, we'll stand and sing.
please be seated. That's a good one, that, isn't it? Haven't seen that one before. I'll begin with a question. Which glass of water is mine? There's two. There's one on the shelf and there's one on the bottom shelf. They're both mine. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Right, thank you for having me. And, um, well, I guess I'm preaching on the heart of the Reformation. And... um, I am from Cardiff. Have you been before? What's that noise? Okay. I'm from Cardiff. And in Cardiff, there are many, many, many religions. People of different religions. And I was in the church the other day. And someone walked into the church of a different religion. And they said to me, Can I cook for your church? because we run meals in our church quite a lot, and they want to do something good. And he is of another religion, and he started talking about his religion, and I said, yes, you can cook. That would be lovely, because he wants to do a big curry for church. Church family, that's nice, isn't it? He wants to do something good. And, uh, yeah, good morning, welcome. Hi. And then he said, I know we're different religions, but we're all God's children. We're all God's children. And I thought to myself, you're sort of right. We're sort of right. So, my big question today is, at the heart of this Reformation Day, are we all God's children? Or, is that only half the story? And is there more to life than just being a child of God? So, I'm going to meet this chap again, and we're going to talk it through. And I'm going to tell you about it this morning as well. Because it got me thinking, are there some people who are in a slightly different relationship with God than other people? Because you've all been made by God, but are some of us, we're all God's children, but are some of us in a slightly different relationship with him than others? Don't know if you've ever thought about that before. That's what I'm preaching on this morning. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you a story. Then I'm going to tell you about Jesus who tells a story. And by the end, hopefully, we'll all be not just all God's children, but possibly in an even better category. Here's my story. There's a problem with my story. I took it from a book, (coughs) and I've lost the book. So it's only half the story from the book, and I've had to make up the bits that I can't remember and I couldn't find the book. Here's my story. It's about a car. Two people were in a car. And for some reason, that I can't remember because I lost the book, there's a bomb in the boot of the car they're driving. It's quite an important detail to not remember that, isn't it? But there we are. They're in the car and the bomb is in the boot. And for some reason, I can't remember why, the passenger in the car knows that there's a bomb in the boot. And the driver doesn't know that there's a bomb in the boot. And then for some reason, but I can't remember why, the police come to learn that there's a bomb in the boot. Right? So they dispatch um, a rescue team to go and help the people with the bomb in the boot. And as they're driving down the road, the flashing lights come in the mirror of the car. And the passenger sees the flashing lights, and he goes, Whoopee! The rescue team have come, because there's a bomb in the boot. But the driver sees the flashing lights in the car and goes, oh, that's an inconvenience to my life. What are they doing here? I don't need them. And then what happens is the police pull the car over, and because they love both the people, they call out to both of them, get out of the car. It's for your good. There's a bomb in the boot. And only one of them gets out. Because there's lots of children in the room this morning, I'm going to make this interactive to keep you awake. Who do you think got out the car? The passenger or the driver? The passenger. passenger. Why? Because he knows there's a bomb in the boot. And then he embraces the police who saved his life. Even though the police called to both and loves them both, 
One enters into a particularly close relationship now with the police. One of embrace and warmth and trust and love because they were rescued. Both people were loved. One's in a special type of relationship. The one who sees their need. And that's the end of my story. We did all right, being out. Was only, I was making half of it up. But that's the story about the police car and the bomb. Now then, Jesus tells a story. And there are certain type of people in his story that are just in a different relationship to God than others. And it seems to be that it's the people who realize they have a need. Okay? And they enter a unique type of relationship that not everybody seems to be in with God, though we're all God's children. Understand? So who does he love? It seems to be this. The people that the rescue team have saved. See? God dispatches a rescuer from HQ in heaven down to planet Earth. And some people just love him and trust him. It seems to be that they enter a different relationship than the average person, though we're all God's children. And the story Jesus tells, he said, that this is what... It, that was a summary of his story, but let's look at it. It's in Luke chapter 18 that we've just read. So if you've closed it, you might want to have a little look. And he tells this story because 2,000 years later, there'd be people in Clidach that he wants to understand the heart of this story. So don't leave without grasping it. That's why it's written down, so that you may have life. And it's called a parable. It's better than the story I told. Do you know why? Because I'm not telling this story. Do you know who's telling this story? God. And when God tells a story, everybody should listen. And just to prove that, in verse 9, look who's telling the story. Jesus told a parable. So this isn't Owen. This is Jesus. And Jesus is the Son of God dispatched from HQ to rescue lost people who have got a big need and a big problem. They've got a bomb in their boot, a bomb in their lives. He's the flashing light. He's called the friend of sinners. He's that protective older brother we all need in life. And now he's telling a story, so we should listen. And he's speaking to people who, well, I'll just read verse 9. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others badly. So God is speaking to men and women and children who think, I don't have a bomb in my <coughs> I don't have a bomb in my boot. I don't have a problem. I'm God's child and he loves me exactly the way I am and I'm good enough for heaven. And by the way, the people standing next to me, they are not good enough for heaven. But I am, and that's why God loves me. And I'm going to treat the person next to me not very nice because they're less than me. And that's who's listening to the story that Jesus is telling. And he's telling them because he wants them to understand something. He wants them to understand that what they think about themselves is desperately wrong. Yes, wrong. Because saying, we're all God's children... According to Jesus, is only half the story. Only half the story, because he's worried that there are people who listen to stories like this and they don't quite know the saving love of God that they could know. And he wants that to change from the youngest in the room to the oldest. And it's written down here so that you can know it and I can know it. Now in this story, well... In modern language, we have words when we tell stories that people back in Jesus' day wouldn't understand. There are words in our vocabulary that we would have to explain to people from Jesus' time if we were telling them a story. Words that didn't exist back then that we have now, like McDonald's. If you said to the Romans, would you like to come to McDonald's? They'd say, what are you talking about? Or... Um, Star Wars, that's my children's word at the moment that they love. Well, the Romans wouldn't know much about that, would they? And um, McFlurry, words like that. But there are words in this story that people in 2023 don't know. 
You might know them, but I'm going to explain them anyway, just in case there are people here that don't, because this is the key to understanding the story. And the first word that in this story that you can call out to keep awake begins with a P, that we don't really know what it means anymore. But we need to know. What do you think the word is? Somewhere in that block. Call it up. Yes, hello. Pharisee. A Pharisee was a churchgoer in the first century, and they basically said this. Here are the rules of God, and we keep them and nobody else does. We're wonderful. In fact, we've made up a lot of rules, which just so happen to suit us, and we keep them. And you don't. You're bad. We're good. Then the second word, well, it's two words that perhaps you don't know what it means anymore. Although you should know this one in this version. It begins with a T. It begins with a C. Word one begins with a T, and the second word begins with a C. What do you think it is? Tax collector. In Jesus' day, there was an empire that ran two-thirds of the world, and they ran it by politics and education and power and armies and might. And they begin with an R. What were they called, children? The what empire? The Roman Empire. And they were in the area that Jesus lived in, Israel. And not only did they invade and take over, so people didn't really like them. Not only that, when they got there, they asked you to give them money for the privilege of them moving into where you lived and give them taxes. Not only that, they employed Jews to take money off other Jews to give to the Romans. Not only that, the tax collectors who were taking from their own also were sometimes corrupt. And when they took money from their friends, obeyed to the Romans, sometimes they didn't quite make it to the Romans because they put it in their pocket and they spent it on themselves. So if you're a tax collector, well, in modern days, you would be called in school, Billy No Mates. Nobody likes you. Nobody. Billy No Mates. Then there's a third word that in this version begins with a J. I'll give you a clue, children. It's in verse 14, and not many people say it anymore. This is the heart of the Reformation. This was a big one in the, back in the day. Because with Jay, go on. Justified. Let me tell you what justified means so we understand this story. Justified in the Bible is sometimes used in like a courtroom type scene. Allow me to explain. Let's just say there's a dad. Let's just say this dad has two boys. Let's just say this dad lives in Cardiff. I'm not saying it's a true story. But just imagine it. Imagine one of the children was seven years old and one of them was nine years old. Imagine when they go for a drive in the car, one of the boys, because they're bigger now, wants to always sit in the front seat, because that's better than the back seat, isn't it? Everybody wants to be in the front seat. Let's just say the younger brother doesn't like that the older brother's always in the front seat. So, they come up with a system. And the system is this. During one trip, I'll sit in the front seat. And during the next trip, you sit in the front seat. And we'll swap. It's a good system, isn't it? It's a clever system. The problem is, these two boys have got something in their boots. It's called sin. And what happens is, uh, we're driving down the road and we get to where we want to go and the one who's in the front seat then to the, to the older brother on the trip on the way home and goes, do you know, I can't remember if I was in the front seat on the way there. So what happens is, the younger brother goes to the older brother, um, I think you were in the front seat and now I think it's my turn. And then the older brother goes, no, I've really forgotten if I was the one in the front seat in the last trip and I think it's my turn again. So the younger brother starts attacking the older brother and a fight breaks out in this imaginary story that may or may not be true. So what happens is, the system goes kaput, a fight breaks out, and then they come and stand before Dad. And Dad, in this courtroom now, hears the whole story. And he listens. And to the one who's telling the truth about themselves, Dad would say... You are justified. You're in the right. I positively agree with you. You're correct. Thank you for telling me the truth. I love you. Come here and I'll pick you up and give you a warm embrace. What you say about yourself 
is true. You're justified. You're positively now loved by me for telling the truth. Come and sit by me. And to the other one, dad might go, you're not telling the truth about yourself. Condemned. Inaccurate. And that's the word justified. Positively loved. And in Jesus' story, in this case, someone is declared to be justified. In the right with God. A blessed, true child of God who knows God like a father. But who it is, is very surprising. Especially if you're a Pharisee. And the last part of Jesus' story, they both, these two people, the Pharisee and the tax collector, pray some prayers and I'm going to read the, t- the Pharisee's prayer, verse 11 and 12. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And what happens now, ladies and gentlemen, is a list of all the good things that he's ever done. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. And that's the end of his prayer. It's a list of all the wonderful reasons why God should love him. And then, here comes the tax collector's prayer. The tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He says, help! He doesn't do this, does he? He goes, help! He doesn't even lift his eyes up to God. There's a bomb in my life. I've got sin. I can't earn your special love. There's nothing in me that I can commend. Help! I need your love. And I'm broken. I can't even lift my eyes up. In my house, I've got a dog. A Labrador. She's the naughtiest dog on planet Earth. Do you know why? She always steals my food before I've eaten it. Sometimes before I've even managed to cook it. It's just gone from the side. A few weeks ago, it was a raw chicken that we were going to have for Sunday lunch. Um, Two days ago, it was chicken fertilizer. Not that I was going to eat the chicken fertilizer, but that nearly finished her off. And then a bit before that, she stole a whole batch of dark chocolate brownies which means she had to go for another trip to the vet, because that's bad. And when she steals food, I walk into the kitchen, and she doesn't even lift her eyes up to look at me. And I say, Rita, that's my wife, the dog's not looking at me again. She's done something wrong. Rita, was there food out on the side cupboards, a cabinet? Yeah, so it's not there anymore. It's gone, and the dog cannot even lift her eyes to see me, because she's ashamed. Do you know why she's ashamed? Because she's broken the laws of my house. She lives in my house, in my world, and I've given her rules for her good, and she breaks them, and then almost dies because of them. Both of my dogs have been in the vet for eating the wrong thing, and she slips away into her crate. Do you know why I don't always like Disney movies? I don't like the Disney movies where the answer to all the world's problems is the person just looks inside and brings out something wonderful that was already there and just shows it to the whole world. And look at me, I'm wonderful as I am. I just didn't know it. And I just bring it out and I'm, I am brave and I am perfect and look at me. Don't like that. I don't like it. It's irritating because it's not true. I don't like it when I turn on the radio and there are religious leaders saying, just be who you are. You're exactly wonderful. Nothing's wrong. And I don't like it because there's no awareness of shame. That actually, if we were honest, we are broken and we do mistreat people and we do mistreat God. And if we were being honest in our prayers, sometimes we shouldn't even lift up our eyes because we haven't been wonderful. We haven't been perfect. And Jesus probably wouldn't be invited to speak on some of the radio shows with the religious leaders because this is the type of prayer that Jesus loves to hear and that his father loves to hear. And it's not, 
Look at me! I'm wonderful! And if you know Greek, it's even more powerful because the prayer that God seems to accept in this story is this. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I'm asking for mercy and help and forgiveness and it's from my heart. I'm humble, Lord. I can't even look up. I don't work properly. Help! There's a bomb in my boot. I am your child, but I'm separate from you because of this sin in my life. There's a French author, he's called Albert Camus, and he said this, I don't think there's a person on earth that I love that I haven't betrayed. Powerful, isn't it? He says even the people he loves in life, he betrays them as well. I took communion to someone in my church not long ago. I opened the door and he said to me, Owen, I'm a very sinful man. And I said, me too. And then we took communion. For this type of prayer, the head goes down. Help, there's a bomb in my life. But it's also wonderful. Because it also means this. There's no one here outside or who needs to be outside of God's saving love. Because we're all sinners. And that's who he saves. And we all can receive forgiveness this morning. And love like we've never known before. And these prayers have two results. The broken man with his need of sin and his lostness goes home with that J word pronounced upon his life. And children, what was the J word? He's justified. You are in the right. You are a child of God. And you are specially loved. Now be blessed. And that means that if I crash the car, because I've been declared justified as, as well, children, if I crash a car on the way home to Cardiff and suddenly am whisked into the next world, do you know what you can say of me? Owen's in heaven. I know it for sure. You could say that about yourself as well, whatever happens in your life. I know I am going to heaven when I die because Jesus has forgiven me. I'm justified. And that, ladies and gentlemen... It's the story of the Reformation. It's the story of Jesus that he tells over and over and over and over again. And here it is in summary. You're all God's children. You've all been made by him. But Jesus came to show you the saving love of the Father. You've got a bomb in your hearts. It's called sin. It's ticking and it will lead to judgment and separation from the Father. But Jesus doesn't want that. That's why he's come. He's the rescue lights from heaven to planet Earth. And being good enough isn't going to defuse the bomb. He says, bring it to me. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. I love you. Tell me about your whole life. The Father has sent me to save the weak and the poor and the lonely and the separated and the deflated and the hopeless, and the sad, and the lost, to bring them back home to God the Father, and to glory in heaven. And if you do feel shame for all the things you've ever done, no new boyfriend or girlfriend will really stop that shame. No drugs will stop the shame. No new job or promotion will take the shame away from you. But Jesus will, over and over again, Jesus will. And if you were a hundred times worse than you are, still your sin is no match for the Father's saving love and mercy that can be shown to you every single day in the power of Jesus. And if you just understand that now in your seats, you're saved. And you'll go home and have dinner, or whatever it is that you're going to do this afternoon, justified now and forevermore. So let's place ourselves in the wonderful arms of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think we should sing God's praises, should we, as we close this service. And the hymn is, Today Thy Mercy Calls Us. And it should be up there. There you go. Thank you.
Our Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the story that he loves to save sinners. Pray that would be the case of everyone in this room, that we leave here not just your children, but signally loved by your saving power. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.